Now, what was the purpose then of this protonation? Yeah, a good leaving group and to make this a better electrophile. Because this positive charge spreads over the whole molecule and makes the whole thing more electrophilic. Last time we talked about how we use acids to make things into better electrophiles and leaving groups, and we use bases to make things into better nucleophiles. After all, was this a good leaving group? No. No, neutral oxygen is a terrible leaving group, so we probably could not get a reaction here with a nucleophile. But now we can. Notice how I'm using a neutral nucleophile here. We don't need that great a nucleophile now that we have such a great, such a reactive compound. So the most likely thing here is to use a nucleophile. Basically, we drew this like an SN2. This helps us to get an SN2. Um, if, if this was a tertiary um, alpha carbon, though, maybe we would get an SN1, where first the leaving group left, and then the nucleophile attacked. So I think that's the most likely thing to do here. He asked you what would happen with a base? Yes. Well, we saw a base could just take this proton. That's not too interesting. Um, what other proton might a base take? I'm saying, oh, one from the carbon that's next to it. What type of reaction would that be? E2. E2. Yeah. So our original guess a, a few minutes ago, someone was guessing that a, the base would take an alpha hydrogen. But actually, we know that in E2 and E1, the base takes the beta hydrogen. Um, I, I think that's a less important reaction this term. But um, a base could take a beta hydrogen, and we could do an E1 or an E2, depending on whether this is primary, secondary, or tertiary. But wouldn't that still have a pronated oxygen? Wouldn't. Who have a pertinent mm -hmm. oxygen? So. Wouldn't the oxygen still be? Yeah. So let's see. How does that help the oxygen? Like, if there's a double bond, it's just going to be like. So, what's well, something that might happen here is. First, this can just leave by itself if the alpha carbon is tertiary. This can just leave by itself if the alpha carbon is tertiary or maybe secondary. And now we can have a base come in. Yeah, but what if it's not tertiary? Is it, what does it say? What's, it, what's the type of mechanism that we just went through here? E2? Yes. Uh, no. Because E2 would be one step. Yeah, this is E1. So um, basically, we got rid of this positive charge by having this leave. And then we got rid of the positive charge on the carbon by doing the second half of the E1. So that seems like a fairly plausible reaction. Uh, you guys were asking, though, what if it's not tertiary? Do you have this in your notes? Yeah. Erase this. Well. This is what D2 reaction would look like, right? Um, and that really would take care of this positive charge over here. Right. The point is, the way to get rid of the positive charge is for this to act like a leaving group. Any reaction where this is going to act like a leaving group is going to take, get rid of that positive charge. We get pretty much the same product whether it's E1 or E2. Both ways we get rid of the charges. I don't really know how common this type of E2 reaction is. I, I don't remember seeing a, a protonated ether go through a, uh, an E2 reaction off the top of my head, but it, it makes some logical sense anyway. And then, and then but the most important thing here is that we can protonate an ether to give it a better leaving group, and then it would be especially likely to be attacked um, by a nucleophile. Sorry? The next one was protonated ketone. OK. Well, we should be somewhat comfortable with that, because that's the types of examples we've been doing. Now you could use a neutral one because since there's already the plus charge, it doesn't necessarily need one. This would just 
see a category one. Okay, now you notice, so we start with a ketone and they asked us what would happen if we protonated it. Well, now we have a protonated ketone and now a nucleophile can attack it. So what was the, what was the, the function of protonating the ketone? So you can use a neutral nucleophile because then you don't necessarily need a negative one, you can use a neutral one because there's already the plus charge there. It's made it more electrophilic. Yeah. Good. The purpose of protonating it was to make it more electrophilic. So perhaps now we can use a weaker neutral nucleophile. What I think you might not have noticed, though, is that if you use a neutral nucleophile, it ends up with a positive charge. So if we're going to be consistent, if we're starting with a neutral nucleophile, it should end up with a positive charge. That's why we should assume that it has a proton. Because now what would be a likely next step? Yes, maybe the solvent or somebody else is going to take this proton. And then we get this product. That's kind of a technicality, but actually we've seen many examples of that already. We've seen many examples where when we start with a neutral uh, nucleophile, it has, to, it has to deprotonate at the end. Last time we saw how when you start with an alcohol, the alcohol has to deprotonate in the last step. And today we saw that if we're starting with water, the water has to deprotonate. But this is just a review of what we've just been talking about. We can protonate the aldehyde of the ketone to make it more reactive with nucleophiles. You were guessing that this would be a category one, but actually we just can't tell what category it is because we don't know what type of nucleophile we're using. For example, we know that if the nucleophile is water, it would be category one. But okay. if the nucleophile is an alcohol, it would be category two, say. Um, how do you know that you're not supposed to use the equilibrium arrows here? Uh, it would have been better if I did. Well, it depends on the nucleophile, uh, again. The, whether it's an equilibrium reaction or not depends on what type of nucleophile. And in the, in the, the handout and the, the assignment that your instructor gave you, they didn't specify the nucleophile. So, uh, and also, I, I don't know how, um, some instructors do not require you to always show equilibrium arrows for every single equilibrium reaction. I don't know how your instructor feels, so I'm not in the habit of always showing those. But um, you usually, usually you get full credit without showing the equilibrium arrows. It depends on what the instructor is looking for. Uh, I guess, though, in this case, uh, let's see, we're doing a protonated reaction. Actually, now that I come to think about it, if we're doing an acid catalyzed reaction, those really are pretty much always equilibrium reactions. So you're right, it would have been better if I had shown it as an equilibrium reaction. So uh, a protonated ketone is more electrophilic. And then the base. Then they also asked, how would a protonated ketone react with the base? Mm -hmm. Is that what they said? That's a little bit weird. So the stupid thing that it could do, which doesn't really change much, it just gives us a ketone, right. would steal the H. Yeah. It could react with the base by just losing its proton, but that would just get us back to where we started. But since there's no beta carbons, there are beta carbons. I could have put in beta carbons. No, I know, but like they don't count. Well, yeah. So you mean beta? No, there are beta. It's like when when you use ketones and aldehydes, the alpha carbon that we used to associate with like alcohols, which would be the carbon connected to the double bonded O, that was not considered alpha. It's just a carbonyl carbon. The one next to the carbon the carbon. So the alphas are like our previous betas. That's the point. So there's two alphas. Because mm -hmm. that's the carbonyl carbon. Right. So that's an important point that we talked about last time. In an alcohol, the alpha carbon is connected to the oxygen. But as you were remembering, in a carbonyl compound, the alpha carbon is not connected to the oxygen. It's connected to the carbonyl carbon. Why don't we call this the alpha carbon? Because we have a better name for it. We call it the carbonyl carbon. So this is the carbonyl carbon, and now these are the alpha carbons. Those are really going to be crucial terms. I think last term, I don't know if your instructor ever really used the terms alpha carbon or beta carbon that much. I don't know if they did. I, I like those terms. Yeah. However, this term, they're definitely going to use those terms alpha carbon. Alpha carbons are crucial in aldehydes and ketones. And we need to know that the alpha carbons are adjacent to the carbonyl carbon. 
Now, I, I think we're on the right track. We, we were saying that it's not very interesting if the base takes this proton. Well, la last time you and I did talk about what's another proton that that's tends to be acidic okay. in a alpha hydrogen. Alpha carbon. Yeah, the alpha, alpha hydrogen. Alpha. Last time we saw that alpha hydrogens in aldehydes and ketones are acidic, and we talked about why that was in our last session. So if the base is not going to take this proton, let's show it taking the alpha hydrogen. That's actually a very important reaction that you'll get to this week or next week. So let's show the base taking the alpha hydrogen. Let's try to come up with a reasonable mechanism for that. Oh, that's the enoid. 